This pandemic may be global, but its impacts are felt very much on the local level. The federal government has opened the spending tabs wide and promised to build back better. How well have they addressed the specific challenges facing rural Ontario, including those issues for which money alone isn't enough? With us now on that, Maryam Monsef. She is the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development. She is the Liberal MP for Peterborough Kawartha, which is where we find her today as part of our collaboration with the Rural Ontario Municipal Association during their 2021 annual conference. Hello, Minister. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, before we got uh, uh, started taping, I was just sharing with you that I'm also a refugee and I also learned how to speak English in part by watching TVO. So it's very nice to have you here today. Likewise, it's quite a privilege to, to be at this seat in this particular moment in Canada's history. Um, you know, um, a lot has happened in the past year. Obviously, the world has been turned upside down because of the COVID uh, pandemic. How do the challenges that rural Ontario um, was facing 10 months ago compare to the ones that they're facing now? Well, to everybody who's on the front lines of COVID, from municipal leaders to uh, first responders to essential workers, we thank you. You're holding it all together for us, and we draw inspiration from you. Most urgent issue in rural communities right now has been broadband. If you are in a community, in a household, without internet access, well, you needed that access yesterday. And the isolation that comes with lockdown, that comes with reducing travel and activity, especially over the holidays, has been particularly hard felt for those Canadians who are living in rural communities like my own. Um, you know, a year ago, not many of us had heard of Zoom. Um, uh, children are uh, learning at home. Teachers are learning how to navigate the online platforms. As you mentioned, in rural communities, there is that additional challenge because of a lack of broadband. Um, what is the government, uh, the federal government, doing to address this urgent issue? Well, we started back in 2015. So there are 1.7 million households who are on their way to getting connected to high-speed internet because of the work we began in 2015. And these are complex projects that take time. They go through a series of environmental assessments and indigenous consultations and engineering and so on and so forth. But back in November, we decided to double down on our plans and we put forward additional funds to connect every Canadian to high speed internet much more quickly. And on Friday, our application process for the rapid response broadband fund closed. We've received hundreds of applications, quality applications, and my team and I are quickly going through them so that we can let proponents know that they've been approved so that they can begin the work and get shovels in the ground this construction season. As you mentioned, this is a very complex issue, but I think if you do live in a rural community, maybe that's not something that, you know, um, when you talk about how much time it's gonna take, it's, um, it makes people uh, anxious, it's affecting people's livelihoods. Um, and back in August, we discussed the broadband uh, problem on the agenda, and I'd like to play you a short clip of uh, my exchange with University of Guelph professor Hel Helen Hambly, who's been leading Canada's oldest ongoing broadband uh, research effort. Sheldon, please roll. Both the federal and the provincial government have promised uh, better broadband. How well are they doing in bridging that digital divide? Uh, so far, it's uh, slow. At this state, um, we are behind countries uh, in Scandinavia, South Korea, uh, and uh, certainly even behind countries like Chile and Mexico and the Czech Republic in terms of fiber penetration. And that's a real concern as we see the dependency that our economies and our societies have on high-speed internet. Well, what's your response to concerns that the progress on the broadband file is so slow that we're behind countries like Chile and Mexico? I think Helen, Professor Hamley's uh, remarks back in August are bang on. And we listen to experts like her, municipal leaders across the country. And when we came out in November with the Universal Broadband Fund, it brought Canada on par with our competitors across the country. This is the single largest investment in broadband in Canada's history. 
It is going to accelerate the pace of connections in communities across the country. The federal government's at the table, and we are committed to ensuring that funding is not the limiting factor for this. And we are working very closely with all partners, including our provincial and territorial partners who are doing their own work on this to ensure that there's a coordination. One of the complexities of broadband projects in Canada this big, beautiful, diverse country of ours is that there are a lot of cooks in this kitchen and rightfully so. Different communities have different needs. So in addition to investing funds, in addition to accelerating the pace of approvals, the federal government has stepped up and we're going to be the coordinator across the country to ensure that there's efficiency and we get rid of as much red tape as possible. Because as you said, Canadians who don't have access to broadband right now for health and safety reasons, for their kids' education or their own skills training, for doing online shopping or teleworking. They simply cannot afford to stay behind the rest of us. And I do believe that Canada's recovery from this recession starts in rural Canada and it begins with broadband. Um, you know, some people have said that uh, more funding isn't necessarily the answer, but rather the smarter use of funding. How would your government approach that? Funds are most certainly part of the challenge. We've heard in the communities that we are focusing our efforts, there simply is not the business case to connect because of lower density populations. There simply isn't the business case for the private sector to step in. So after talking to thousands of providers and experts and leaders across the country, we heard them say the federal government can do its part by ensuring that there's a flexible program in place, that we cover backbone and last mile, that there's investments in cell, as well as the unique ways that communities can accelerate connections in their communities. We also have heard that there are challenges with shared infrastructure, this issue of passive infrastructure in places like Quebec and in Ontario and otherwise. So those coordination tables that are set up, the incentives we've put in this new program to share that infrastructure are meant to get us past the hurdles that we have learned from in the past. We know that there are smaller communities, particularly, you know, 60% of municipalities have fewer than five staff doing the work. And this is hard work in a pandemic. So we've decided to add, as per their request, a concierge service to this program. So you pick up the phone, you call us, somebody really smart like an engineer picks up the phone on behalf of the federal government, and they help communities navigate this complex process, connect them with engineers, provide them with updated maps so that they can be supported in putting their applications forward and not be held back because they are a smaller communities with smaller capacity. I know people who are listening uh, to this, uh, especially in rural communities, and we should probably keep in mind that uh, rural communities are not a monolith. Rural, different rural communities uh, need different things. Um, but if they're listening to this, there's a frustration with having to navigate life in 2021 uh, during a pandemic, and there's a lack of broadband. You're cut off from the rest of the world. As you said, uh, in November, the prime minister announced plans to connect 98% of Canadians to high-speed internet by 2026 and a goal of connecting all Canadians by 2030. There are municipal officials in Ontario who've said the federal government's um, 2030 timeline is unacceptable. Uh, one of those officials is uh, Kelly Elliott, the deputy mayor of Thames Centre, which is an underserved a part of the country when it comes to high-speed internet. Um, here she here's how she described the issue to us via email. Today, rural children are struggling to access their virtual education. Rural Canadians cannot access resources and programming when it comes to health care, including mental health resources. Municipalities are struggling to market themselves for investments when a business cannot operate without basic internet. In the year 2021, where our lives are dependent on a virtual world, what do you say to rural Canadians who are struggling and are being told, just wait, nine more years, when they have already struggled and waited for so long. What's your message to rural Ontarians who are tired of waiting for broadband? Uh, to Madam Deputy Mayor and to anyone watching this, you have every reason to be frustrated. Life is hard enough as it is. In the best of times, it is incredibly difficult during COVID. 
and even more so without the opportunity to FaceTime your loved ones, without having a glitch free connection that lets you do your work and stay on top of the news. So you have every right to be frustrated and know that the federal government has heard you. We got your back and we're doing everything we can to get communities connected faster. Now, the 2030 timeline is for the 2% of communities in Canada, the hardest to reach regions, which are probably going to get connected through low Earth orbit satellites. The other 98%, we are accepting applications. We will be opening a new round of applications to connect communities. And I want every Canadian watching this to know that the federal government is going to do everything it can with our partners to connect as many Canadians as quickly as possible. It's not just a matter of fairness. It's not just a matter of health and safety. It's a matter of Canada's competitiveness in the post COVID world. And we are all in this together. So to municipal leaders, to indigenous leaders, to our provincial colleagues, to anyone interested, please reach out to us. That concierge service that we've set up is specifically designed to provide additional supports so that every community who wants to get connected has the support of the government of Canada to make that connection happen. Um, we, uh, you mentioned this needs to be done faster, and uh, I'm sure people in the uh, uh, communities that don't have broadband want it done yesterday. Uh, what do you think is needed from industry and other levels of government to tackle the broadband issue at a more rapid pace? We're there. The, 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 the good news is that things are moving, communities are getting connected. At the end of 2020, for example, tens of thousands of households who didn't have connection at the beginning of the year had that high speed access. So things are happening, shovels are going into the ground. Uh, you know, our, our essential workers were doing that work even during COVID as safely as possible following those guidelines. And this coming construction season, we're gonna see hundreds of projects move forward through the new program. And my, my best advice, in fact, my plea to anybody watching this is, we're here to help. There is money on the table and we're going to do everything we can to support high quality projects to move forward. So please reach out to us and we will get this done together as quickly as possible. Is there a little bit, I know um, uh, hindsight is 2020, but is there a bit of frustration from the government for uh, being in the place that we are today, because I think the pandemic was maybe the final nail to say, hey, uh, we do have a real broadband connectivity issue in Canada. Is there a sense in government that maybe we should have uh, taken this more on head sooner? As I said, we've been working on this file since we formed government, right? 1.7 million households on their way to getting connected or already connected because of the work and the investments that were done in 2015. But I will share a personal frustration with you. Back when we could travel back and forth between Ottawa and Peterborough Kawartha, which is where I'm from, the highway that connects us being the highway, highway, seven, highway 7, along this highway, it is hard not to see the hollowed out smaller communities who are beautiful, rich in resources, rich in their natural heritage. It is hard to drive by those smaller communities who never recovered, who never fully recovered after the 2008 recession. Investments in connectivity back then, investments in cell service back then would have been completed and would have allowed that connection and connectivity to communities along that route today. But you know what? We are determined to learn from the mistakes of the past. We will not be repeating them. And as I said, the vision here is that recovery begins in rural Canada and it begins with broadband access. You're also a minister for women and gender equality um, and the lack of connectivity um, along vast stretches of highway uh, also becomes a safety issue. One of the populations at risk for violence in these areas include indigenous women. Um, what progress has been made with implementing the calls for justice from the final report of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls? To think that there are long stretches of roads and highways, as you said, 
all across this country, those highways of tears, where our daughters find themselves in really horrible situations and they can't even call for help is unthinkable. Part of the Universal Broadband Fund includes funds set aside specifically to address those very long stretches of the roads where tragedies like missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls happen far too often. Uh, Minister Bennett and I met with all the ministers in Canada responsible for the status of women, as well as Indigenous leaders and representatives a few days ago. And the purpose of this meeting was to get an update on how COVID is affecting Indigenous women and girls, but also to track our progress on the response to the calls for justice, the 231. At this point, we are moving closely with our partners forward. We are working to ensure that women are safe, that their families are cared for, and that they are working. And at a time when COVID has hit women hardest, particularly Black, Indigenous, and racialized women hardest, we are all renewing our resolve to do better so that those women can not only be in safer situations, but that they can contribute to Canada's recovery to their fullest abilities. Uh, women living in rural areas are also overrepresented when it comes to domestic violence. Uh, and during the COVID pandemic, we've been hearing a lot about the shadow pandemic. Um, studies suggest that the issue of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, has increased uh, since March. Federal consultations from your own government showed um, 20 to 30 percent increase. And you yourself noted that in some places, the calls for help have gone up some 400 percent, which is astounding. Um, your party, which has prided itself in being a feminist government, has been criticized for not doing enough to address domestic violence uh, during this pandemic. How do you respond to that? To anybody who's in an abusive home, who is unsure as to whether there are resources and supports out there, I want you to know that there are thousands of organizations across this country in smaller communities and in urban centers whose doors are open to you, who are working hard to get the cleaning supplies and the PPE so that for you and your loved ones, there is safety and care available. So if you're experiencing violence, talk to someone you trust and reach out to one of these organizations. We've supported some 1,500 organizations across the country to keep their doors open, to keep their staff paid, and to ensure that they are safe and available for women and children in their hour of need. So do you reject this, the criticism that your government hasn't done enough? I can assure anybody watching this that we're doing everything we can to eradicate gender-based violence. And if I may, Canada has recently been acknowledged by Care International as having the single best analysis of how COVID affects women and diverse communities. And that's something that we take with some humility, knowing that we're on the right track. We are doing more. We are investing fivefold in frontline women's organizations compared to how things were before we formed government. There is an additional $50 million in uh, circulation right now, directly providing that to frontline organizations into their bank accounts so they don't have to go through a lengthy application process. There will be additional funds coming, some $100 million this quarter to support organizations with the response to COVID and recovery. And I know that until every single case of domestic violence and gender-based violence ends, our work is not complete. But I also know that our government has invested more in women's organizations and in intersectional feminism theory, practice, and programming than any other government in Canada's history. And we continue to build on that success because as I said, Canada's recovery depends on it. And our sisters and our daughters and our kids are counting on us. Uh, we're hearing a lot of um, anecdotal stories of how women have been um, disproportionately been impacted during this pandemic. Uh, many of them putting their lives and their families' lives at risk while working low-paying jobs on the front lines. What is your message to them? I would say that the statistics support those anecdotes, that those women on the front lines of the response 
to COVID, the women fighting this, well, the sectors fighting this are over 90% women, and they are often racialized women, black women who are taking on these essential care responsibilities for the rest of us. So to those of you who work in long-term care homes, who get up every day and go back into those risky situations, even after an outbreak has been called, and you look after our elders with the respect and with the carefulness that you do, we thank you. To those who are you know, looking after our grocery stores, to those who are answering calls of women and trans folks in distress, experiencing the violence and abuse, we thank you. Know that the government of Canada has your back and know that there is a nation and a reckoning happening where we appreciate the true value of this essential care work that has for so long held our economies together and we're just beginning to understand truly the value of that work now. We will not forget you and provinces, territories, the federal government are working together to support you in every way we can. And another word that we've been hearing a lot in the last year or so is uh, this she session. Um, and when it comes to the gender wage gap, last year Oxfam Canada found that little progress has been made. What is the federal government doing to ensure equal pay and better work opportunities for women, uh, including those in rural Ontario where there's a labour shortage that's only going to get worse? Absolutely. Women have been hit hardest by COVID in terms of being on the front lines, but also hours lost in employment, additional care responsibilities. I've yet to have a meeting with my team or partners across the country where little ones aren't running around. They're helping with uh, schoolwork. They're looking after elders. And of course, rates of gender-based violence have increased. And these are all issues fundamental to our community's health and prosperity and our recovery. You heard uh, Christia Freeland, the first woman to be finance minister, I may say in, in uh, federal history, uh, speak very clearly about the need for universal early learning and childcare. That is going to be key to our recovery. You've heard colleagues like Minister Hussein invest in rapid housing. Women are the first to use to lose affordable housing and they are the last to gain it. And so our rapid response investments in housing ensure that women are not trapped in uh, abusive situations. And they also ensure that when we tell people to go home and to stay home, well, not everyone has a place to call home. And these housing dollars are a way to do that. In addition to all that, we're also working to ensure that the skills training needed to support women and frankly, all Canadians get back into the workforce or respond to the jobs available are there. And that's a partnership with provinces, with territories that we've embarked upon. So I say all this knowing full well, the job one right now is to limit community spread and to ensure that we roll out the vaccine and that every Canadian who wants a vaccine has it by September so that we can get on with the work of getting our economy back, getting our communities back, and rebuilding better. Uh, late last year, Royal Bank released a study that showed uh, the percentage of women leaving the workforce during this COVID pandemic. Um, and when women do hopefully return to work in the same numbers uh, in the aftertimes, childcare is going to be of paramount importance. Uh, you mentioned the childcare. Um, what is the timeline for a national childcare strategy? Well, that work is happening right now. You heard in the fall economic statement, in, in the fall, obviously, uh, the finance minister put forward an ambitious plan uh, that also included a strong commitment to universal early learning and child care. She, she made it very clear that she was going to, you know, nose to the grindstone on this one. And as a working mom, she takes this very seriously as does the Prime Minister. So that work is ongoing and the Government of Canada is working on a Women in the Economy Action Plan, which in addition to the work already underway includes convening really smart economists and feminists who can help guide the way, setting up the Secretariat for Early Learning and Child Care, hearing from early learning and child care workers themselves, like the ones here in Peterborough, who are telling me that for the first time in a really long time, they are hopeful about Canada having a system 
a system in place that is universal, that is quality and affordable, and they want to be part of those conversations. So all of this work is happening, of course, in parallel to the track that is responding to COVID and rolling out the vaccine and to all the women on the front lines of that work inside governments, in clinics, in communities across the country. We thank you. History is going to remember you well. And we look forward to the day when you don't have as much as you do on your plate. Um, so you don't have a timeline, though? Because I think a lot of people are interested in knowing when that would happen. The work of designing an early learning uh, child care system that is universal takes a little bit of time. But as the prime minister and the finance minister said, we're willing to work with any province and territory who's ready to go on this. So those conversations are happening. And the best timeline I can provide you is as soon as possible. Of course, funds have already flown. Some 40,000 spaces that didn't exist before reform government have already been created. And we are looking to accelerate that work. There is a budget coming. Our province, provincial colleagues are doing the same. Uh, that work is happening, and we are determined to get it right. The Quebec model, of course, provides us all with a really good North Star, mm -hmm. something that has shown to work, that has shown uh, to get women back into the workforce. Uh, so we're not starting from scratch. We're building on success that has already existed and models that are right in front of us. Um, we have about 30 seconds left, but uh, we've been hearing a lot of uh, uh, stories of people leaving, uh, say, Toronto, for example, and moving um, up north. Um, but some people are deterred from leaving the urban core because, again, lack of internet uh, broadband. Uh, what is the future for rural Canada? The future for rural Canada is bright. As you said, the quality of life that we enjoy here is being sought by many. The quality of life is about to improve with universal broadband access as it rolls out across the country. Rural communities have a tendency to care for each other and there's a great level of interdependence. We've supported digital main streets and more small businesses are online. And we are also supporting rural communities with their housing needs and with other infrastructure needs. So the future is bright. Our challenge as rural communities and rural leaders is to ensure that that growth that is inevitably happening is manageable and sustainable and the government of Canada is at the table to provide any support to that end. Uh, Minister Monsef, that is our time. We really appreciate your insights and taking uh, time out of your busy schedule during this pandemic to speak to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.